All right, for those who watch on YouTube, thank you guys so much for watching online. We really appreciate you guys' support. Feel free to share. Feel free uh, uh, to comment. We'll love to hear what you have to say. Also, I want to let you guys know those 5,000 new subscribers we've got in the last four days. We want to welcome you guys to the channel. Thank you guys for being a part. Uh, for those who's been pushing the videos, thank you guys so much. For, for those who may not know, what we do here, we have a weekly Bible study here in Charlotte, 3646 Central Avenue. If you're in the area, we'll love to see you. Feel free to engage. Feel free to get to know us. There's a link in the description box. We'll love to get, you, to get to know you guys a little bit more. Feel free to learn about our ministry as well as way, in ways you can give. So please get involved. For those listening online on Google Podcasts and Apple Podcasts, thank you guys so much for listening. Feel free to subscribe, rate us, let us know what you think about the podcast and so forth. But for those in the room, let's get right into Mark chapter 4. It was crazy. These last four days, we got 5,000 subscribers on YouTube, 60-something thousand new views. So I don't know who shared it, but we thank you. <coughs> so if you're watching right now, <coughs> thank you for, for getting the word out. Mark chapter 4. Again, he began to teach beside the sea. And a very large crowd gathered about him so that he got into a boat and sat in on the sea. And the whole crowd was beside the sea on the land. And he was teaching them many things in parables. And in his teachings, he said to them, listen, behold, a sower went out to sow and as he sowed, some seed fell along the path, and the birds came and devoured. Other seed fell on rocky ground where it, had, where it did not have much soil, and immediately it sprang up, since it had no depth of soil. And when the sun rose, it was scorched, and since it had no root, it withered away. Can someone check to make sure I press record on that, that video? I don't remember if I did. It was scorched, and since it had no root, we good, thank you. Since it had no root, it withered away. Other seed fell among thorns, and the thorns grew up and choked it, and it yielded no grain. And other seeds fell into good soil and produced grain, growing up and increasing and yielding thirtyfold and sixtyfold and a hundredfold. And he said, He who has ears to hear, <clears throat> let him hear. And when he was alone, those around him with the twelve asked him about the parables. And he said to them, To you has been given the secrets of the kingdom of God, but for those outside, Everything is in parables, so that they may indeed see, but not perceive, and may indeed hear, but not understand, lest they should turn and be forgiven. And he said to them, do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all the parables? The sower sows the word, and these are the ones along the path where the word is sown. When they hear, Satan immediately comes and takes away the word that is sown in them, and these are the ones... Sown on rocky ground, the ones who, when they hear the word, immediately receive with joy. And they have no root in themselves, but endure for a while. Then, when tribulation or persecution arise on account of the word, immediately they fall away. And others are the ones sown among thorns. They are those who hear the word, but the cares of the world, and the deceitfulness of riches, and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word, and it proves unfruitful. But those that were sown on the good soil, I hope that's us, are the ones who hear the word and accept it and bear fruit, some 30, some 60, and some 100 fold. Let's pray. Father God, we thank you so much for who you are. God, I'm so glad you're the gardener of my heart, toiling it to ensure that the soil is rich enough to receive the seed of salvation. Father God, I pray that as I speak today and as we discuss what we have read over this past week, I pray that the words that are spoken through me are from you. Lord, I'm thankful that, that you are such a loving God, a God that gives the opportunity to even be able to, to even try to discuss or even try to, to articulate your precious gospel. With that being said, God, I am so appreciative that you have chosen me. And with that being said, God, I desperately need your words to speak through me because your words through me is life. I'm just a vessel from your spirit. It's where the power comes from, where it destroys the yoke, God. So if you're not in this room, Lord, I'm wasting their time. So God, you hear my heart, you hear my words. Lord, I pray that you intervene and invade this space and you may be prayed. Amen. Amen. For those who are brand new, we have worship that goes without, without discussion. So let's get right into it. There's two questions. This is going to be a long four or five week talk where we're going to be talking about the different soils. But the question number one is, is there enough evidence in your life to prove that you are saved? That's one of the questions. Question number two is, is there anything in your life that you are allowing to harden your heart, 
to weaken your commitment to God, to carry cares, and or pursue earthly riches? These are the two questions. I think when we understand our purpose and the purpose of the gospel, we will take the time that we need to seek and search our hearts to see is there any evidence of salvation? Question one, is there enough evidence? Question two, is there anything hindering? My theme for this talk, this is the intro, so I'm going to take my time and give you guys some time to discuss what you talk, what you, what you got from the chapter. The main theme of this parable is to reveal the four responses people have towards the gospel. There's four, uh, I think I have four things, four points. We're going to talk about the sower, the system, the seed, the soil, and the supply. The sower, the system, the seed, the soil, the supply. Let's go to the sower. God's desire is for us to be converted and to bear fruit. The Bible talks about the sower sows. If anyone knows anything about gardening, they understand that a sower sows with an intent. He sows or she sows with a return in mind. God's desire is for us to be converted and to bear fruit. Many people throughout life are not taking a necessary amount of time to even see if there's evidence of conversion. There's a difference between going to the altar and saying, hey, I want to receive Christ, versus being converted with fruit proving that you have been supernaturally saved by Jesus. Many people get it confused because Christianity has become a fad over the last few decades. It's become a badge of honor. It's become a, 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 a country club, if you will. And so many people just feel like if I sign my name on a membership slip, a slip, then I must be saved without taking the time to see, do I have evidence of salvation? When John the Baptist was in the wilderness and the Pharisees came to see what he was doing, he said, you brood vipers, bear fruit with keeping with repentance. We have to look at our lives and say, God, have you truly pursued me? Is there evidence in my life that the rich seed of salvation has been sown in my life with evidence of fruit? His desire is for us, the sower's desire is for us to be converted and to bear fruit. Number two, this kind of introductory kind of talk, just bear with me. His plan is is to ensure we receive salvation through the process of toiling. Toiling. Toiling is a process where the farmer prepares the soil to receive seed. If there's no toiling of the ground, then the ground will not be rich enough or prepped for the seed to do what it's supposed to do. The seed's power is to a degree predicated on the richness of the soil. The seed in of itself has the ability, but the transaction doesn't occur if the soil is not ready. That's why God says, my process of toil, you feel, is a season of pain. But if you have to be toiled so that, that when I do plant the seed in your life, then you can be able to bear the fruit I need. Many people's hearts are too hard. That's why if the toiling is not there, then there cannot be any fruit. God's desire or his plan is to ensure we receive salvation through the process of toiling, preparing the soil. Point three, his pursuit <clears throat> and his toiling is proof you are either being prepped to be saved or, or, or are on course to being sanctified. Sanctification is a process after justification. Meaning, when Christ has pursued me and he says, that's my son, that's my daughter, I am now justified as saved, hid, chosen, pursued after. The next process is being sanctified, purged, removing things out of the, out of the old way of living, that way. Number four, he sows with the return in mind. God is a God of details. He is consumed with the minute things because the little things is what builds the big things. 
He sows with the return in mind. Do you know this sower? Because there's many sowers. Two, if we get specific, the kingdom of God and the kingdom of Satan. If we're not careful, our soil, our heart, could be guarded or uh, kept by Satan himself. That's why we have to make sure we're careful about really examining ourselves and, says, and asking ourselves, whose am I? Do I truly bear fruit that gives me enough evidence to be guilty as charged as a follower? I'm not saying guilty as charged as being a Christian, because you can go to church and raise your hands and worship. You can pray, you can speak in unknown tongues, you can do a lot of things with the Christian tag. But do you actually follow him? Do you actually bear his fruit? Let's go to the system. <clears throat> the heart is prime real estate. It is the most sought after land on earth. The heart is prime real estate. It is the most sought after land on earth. Meaning, the greatest land is not in Miami. The greatest sought after land is not in the Hamptons or or by the bay or wherever. That's not, the, that's not the most prime real estate. The prime real estate is human's hearts. If you have the human's heart, you have the human's life. For out of the heart flows the issues, the springs of life. Who's bought the most land on your heart? Who owns the prime real estate of your heart? Check your fruit and we can know who your farmer is. Many people go by life so fast without taking a necessary amount of time to examine their heart. Satan's system endeavors to fill our hearts with so much junk with the intent of hindering the word of God once it's sown. This system is designed to make it hard for us to be saved and to be fruitful. This system designed by Satan is designed to ensure that, number one, it's hard for you to get saved, and number two, it's hard to walk out. <laughs> See, once you say he can't take it. You know, he's like, God pursues you, but he wants to make it difficult. This system is designed because attention is what people are after. Social media, Facebook, Snapchat, Instagram, everybody is trading attention. That's why ads pop up where the most eyes are. So the goal is how can I get your eyes off the mark and on everything else without taking the time you need to examine your life. Listen, if you know that you're a pilgrim passing through, you would not get consumed with the people of this land. And what I mean by that, the influences of this land. Because you know for a fact all of this it's fake right. compared to what's really real. So when you know the truth and the truth has set you free, you are now able to see now. There's a lot of people, like I said last week, who can see, but their mind is blind. They, they see, but they can't perceive. So what happens is they don't even know they're in a way. They don't even know they're deceived. That's why I say everyone in this room is deceived to some degree. Because Satan... Is a genius at what he does. And many people take him as a little imp with horns and a tail and a pitchfork. And they run around their church and Satan is defeated. He's under my feet. You know the old songs? But they're defeated in their daily lives. Jesus, what he did on the cross, disarmed him. But it didn't shut his mouth. His only weapon against us is words. So if he can speak, because think about it, in the garden, did he bring Eve to the tree? We don't even know how long he was around the tree. He was probably, I'm just going to wait here because I know she's going to come around because the grass is getting a little high. They got to cut this grass. They, 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 they got to tend this. They were supposed to take care of the garden. He's like, I'm just going to wait by here because I can't make her do nothing. I'm powerless. So he didn't want her. He wanted her power. He gave Adam and Eve dominion. <clears throat> he wanted that dominance. 
And the best way to get that dominance is to make Eve and Adam do what he did in heaven. He saw what he lost with just a decision. So he said, all I got to do, can I make her decide to choose <clears throat> to not be beside God anymore? And if I can get her to do that, <clears throat> Then I know God, who's a holy God, is going to have to pr 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 produce judgment. He said the best way to get after God's heart is to touch what he created. Think about that. Anybody who's a mom in here, a father watching online, if someone was to even just touch your baby in the wrong way, you turn to an immediate savage. Yeah. Crazy. My mom, if something was to happen to me now, she'll rip somebody's throat off and then cook it and saute it. She'll do, my mom, listen, you touch somebody's baby? So he knew, how can I get God in a predicament? Because God surely won't damage the created thing. But Satan didn't know that he said, that's going to be one come through the womb of a woman. Amen, amen. Who you will bruise his heel, but he will bruise your head. See, God was two moves ahead of Satan. That's why he's after your dominance today. That's why he's saying you have to bear fruit because the fruit is what's going to help feed others. Right. Let's keep going. I'm ahead of myself. <clears throat> you learning something? Satan's system endeavors to fill our hearts with so much junk with the intent of hindering the word of God once it's sown. This system is designed to make it hard for us to be saved and to be fruitful. Our need for salvation and the proof of the gospel is evident all around us, but a lot of people's hearts are too blind to see it. My question to you is, who owns the most real estate in your heart? Jesus was talking to his boys, and he was like, fellas, listen, ladies, if you're around, listen, listen closely. You heard me tell, tell the parable to the crowd, but let me tell you what this parable means. He began to say, the sower sows the word. The word in this text is salvation. Salvation as the sea is where everything floods out of you. If there is no saving work of Christ in my life, then I truly cannot be a loving person. If the saving work of Christ is not in my life, I won't be a person full of joy. I will be con uh, 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 condemned or uh, 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 heightened or suppressed through my need for happiness. If I don't have the saving work of Christ, I won't be patient or long-suffering. If I, if I, these things are needed. We think we need bigger buildings. We think we need better lives. We think that we need better methods to reach the people. He says, if you preach my message with sincerity of heart and you have fruit in your life, he says, my greatest marketing plan, you heard me say this many times, is not flyers, is not likes, is not presentations or concerts, it's a changed life. When mama looks at you and say, baby, ain't the same no more, she's going to follow what man sought you. When you have used to live crazy and your dad looks at you like, who saved you? Because when your life has been changed and you wonder why, sometimes you wonder, God, why you let people sin so long? He says, I want the stench to be so, so dense so that when a change happens, everyone will notice. Listen, <clears throat> that's why the woman the woman who was caught in the act of adultery and the woman who met him at the well. Because the woman at the well, she was a prostitute. The people in the city knew who she was. They knew her story because you know how I can tell you knew her that they knew her story? Because she didn't get her water in the morning or the evening. Everybody, the soccer moms and all the, the prestigious women, the Pharisees' wives, all of them got their water during the coolest time of the day. But since she was a harlot, she didn't want to be embarrassed getting water with the other ladies who was going to talk about her. So she went at noon. Noon in the Middle East is about 100 degrees. So you can almost imagine her walking. One of her heels is broken. Her skirt, she's trying to get, keep it low because she's walking by this Chick-fil-A. And she's walking by this Whole Foods. And then she knows they're watching. But she knew she had to get some water. But I'm so thankful that my Jesus can sit at the well at the hottest of the day right. to ensure that he has a conversation with me. He's the greatest soul. Right. 
Because when she met him at the well, that woman was like, you talking to me? I understand if he talked to, to Bishop's wife and, and a pastor's wife, but you, talk, you can almost imagine she's trying to fix her hair because she, she was in her presence. Because I don't think Jesus just had an earthly male presence. I think he had something special about him. An aura that made her feel that she could be drawn. And she began to have a conversation. She knew what the Bible said. She said, look, look, look. Our forefathers built this well. What you mean that if I drink from you, I'll never thirst again? I fuck. He said, I don't care what your fathers made. My father made me so you won't thirst again. And Jesus will always sit in between him and your former source. The Bible says when she told him all that she was, she was like, and Jesus was like, well, wait, where's your husband? She was like, what you mean? I'll try to get at you. And I'm joking. She was, like, she was like, what you mean, my husband? He says, you're right. You, you have five. Don't get the story forward. And she was so shocked. That the Bible says she left what she was supposed to use to draw the water to go show the people and tell the people who she met. Her life changed. The Bible said helped change that city. Listen, the devil is after your testimony. He's after it. Because when people really see your life change, they want to meet the person that changes lives. Y'all all right? Mm -hmm. Words. Let's go to the seed, I'm sorry. The seed of salvation produces fruit, and the fruit is proof there is salvation. You can't have one without the other. Let's go to the next point. Words and suggestions equal seeds. All words are seeds, and our hearts reflect the seed sown. Negative words, am I going too fast? I'm good? Negative words are powerful. They can harden, Hinder, hurt, and hoodwink. They can harden the, the, the seed sown in the path. They can hinder the seed sown into ground with no, no root. They can hurt hearts full of thorns and hoodwink the seed to pursue uh, riches. Negative influences lead to poor investments, which lead to inactivity and carnal activity. Positive influences lead to proper investments, which lead to proper activity. The devil understands how can I get the person's heart so hard that if there is an attempt for that person's soul to be saved, that person won't receive. That's why he goes through so much to, to attack you when you're the most vulnerable. Why do you think molestations happen at a young age? Abuse happen at a young age. Rape happens in vulnerable situations. Abandonment happens. He knows, how can I bruise the heart before God mends it? How can I hurt the person before they can even have the opportunity to be healed? But the devil didn't realize, or he never understands, that God always has a plan after a plan. That just because he has pursued you in regards to the system and you have been hurt, he said, God said, there's no hurt too high for me to heal. Amen. So he's saying, do not allow your hardened heart, your shallow heart, your anxious heart to confuse you and thinking I can't get to you. That's why I am so confident that he pursued me. And I used to wonder, God. I was with him since I was six years old, y'all. So this ain't, this ain't no game. I was with him since six, but he didn't really get to my heart till I was 19. I don't know where I was saved. I just know I'm bearing fruit, right? But there was something that happened when life began to just feel like the hand of God was just toiling. Do not despise the days where you feel isolated, drifting, in pain, wilderness experiences. God, why was I planted here? Why was I placed here? He said, baby girl, when you see that, see that flower cracking through that concrete? Listen, I can produce fruit no matter how hard the heart is. And God is saying, but you gotta let me toil it. Right. 
And many of us avoid it. Therefore, when you avoid the hand of God from toiling, it shows that you don't want to be saved. We want gentle hands. <laughs> manicured hands. We think God's hands are manicured. God's a farmer. God's a creator. He gets in this thing. And he's saying, man, when are you going to let me get access to your heart? That's why my question is, do you even have evidence that you're even saved? That's the first question you should seek after. Am I bearing enough fruit? Because many people read this text, they think it's a good story about different hearts. But they feel to realize that the true point of this gospel, of this parable, is the four responses to the gospel. Only one heart is saved, and that's the heart with the good ground. But how many people's hearts are so hard, so shallow, so full of deceitfulness and thorns that they reject the one that wants access? The soil, let's go there. The seed's purpose is predicated on the posture of the soil. You put an apple tree in the wrong soil, and it ain't gonna work. The type of soil we have to rep okay, the type of soil we have represents our response to the gospel. There's four responses. Let's break down these hearts for the next weeks. We're gonna talk about each one, but we're gonna go through it briefly. The hardened heart. The Bible talks about. Do you not understand this parable? How then will you understand all the parables? The sower sows the word. And these are the ones along the path, the hardened heart, the hardy ground, where the word is sown. When they hear, Satan immediately comes and takes away the word that is sown in them. The hardened heart represents someone who is hardened by sin. They hear, but have no understanding. Satan plucks the message away immediately, keeping the heart hard. The birds in this text represent the, the demons, the, 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 the fierceness of them that comes as soon as you hear the word. Or a person's heart's hard, they pluck it up immediately. So many people, hearts are so hard. That if they really met God genuinely, they won't re receive them. When they talk about the blasphemy of the Holy Spirit, they think that if you say it, you're forever damned from heaven. What the text really means by that, he's saying anyone who consistently and persistently rejects the work of the Holy Spirit, those won't be saved. So all these people on YouTube that say, oh shoot, five years ago was a big challenge. Last night, all of those challenges back five, seven years ago, where this guy, this atheist, went around, had people saying it, blasphemed all the ghosts. So these people kept saying it, and now they traumatized because they're like, oh gosh, I'm damned from, ever, from heaven. Mm -mm -mm. Just because you say it, don't mean it. We're talking about the consistent, persistent hardness of the heart towards the gospel. Mm -hmm. You don't got to be bold about it, you can be subtle about it. There's some people who actually follow Jesus with hard hearts. Oh, you, what, you, what you mean? Pain, no prosperity. What you mean I got to go through something? What you, oh, I don't want that, Jesus. See, people, that's why he said, do not even form in your mind a graven image of him. People's hearts are soft to the Jesus they want, but hardened to the real Jesus himself. Meaning, anybody can determine. That's why when you see these pictures of Jesus in the wine says as a white man, the man was from the Middle East. So people keep saying like, this image, this image, and we focus on this image, focus on this presentation with the halo behind the Catholic Church, all these different pictures and images. People will draw, design, put up any image of Jesus that makes them happy. Listen, following Jesus is not a happy experience. It's a joyful one. Happiness is based upon conditions. I'm only happy if Jesus does this. I'm only happy if he actually comes around 4.30 when I need him. Mm -hmm. But when you, I, one thing I love about God, I used to hate about God was he don't budge. The Bible says he's immutable. But the word the Bible put immutable in there. It's an attribute the Bible through scripture talks about a God that never changes. 
The Bible, we heard this. Mama done told us, baby, he was saying yesterday, today, <laughs> and forever. Jesus does not change at all. I'm thankful that he does not Because I know that rock is sturdy enough. See, you see, people change. That's why you don't put your stock in people. People change. Your mama who breastfed you, took care of you, clothed you, can change on you. Daddy who can change on you. Your husband can change on you. But I know a man who won't change. And it's comforting because I know if I go to the Word, I find out I know that it's infallible, that it's real, that it's true, that it's God-breathed. And if I know for a fact that it's accurate and this person is alive and I deal with him every day, then what he says I can bank on. Because he doesn't change. Oh, but people, since he doesn't change, let me develop my own image. Hmm. Because since he ain't changing, I don't want, listen, that's why I don't, there's a bunch of people who profess the name of Jesus. And the Bible, the scripture that really choked, that really stopped me was, many in that day will cast out demons in my name, do marvelous works in my name. But he says, I will look at them and say, I never knew you. Oh my God. You mean to tell me I could cast out demons using the name? Do marvelous works using the name? He says, my name has power. And I do not want to be a person who develops and follows a fake Jesus, thinking in my heart he was softened, but I, my heart was hard the whole time. You have to look at yourself and say, what Jesus am I following? Because of the word of God sown about pruning, I won't receive. The word sown about not having sex before marriage, I ain't gonna receive it. Listen, if you follow when Jesus says, he says, if, if uh, what's the scripture says, um, basically he's saying, don't call me friend if you're not gonna follow my commandments. Mm -hmm. If you love me, that's the word, thank you, Holy Spirit. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. That scripture almost hints towards some type of uh, righteousness, uh, not righteousness, but um, working for it. Mm -mm. That, he says, you work not, you don't work for love. You work from love. Because you love me. You will be, when you love somebody and she want a cheesecake at 2 in the morning and you love somebody and mama is not feeling well, when you love somebody you keep certain standards. If you don't love them, you won't keep no standards. My question to you is, are you keeping his standards for ritualistic purposes, or you maintain instead of because you love him. Right. Because when you love him, listen, man, you can be in the hardest of places, and you can feel like, God, I don't want to do it, but God said, you know you love me. Do this for me. Listen, if you love me, by God, I got you, because he's been too good. But that goodness it's, it's, it's a strong type of goodness. A goodness that has to be respected. The Bible says it was his, it's his goodness that draws man to repentance. <clears throat> People look at that goodness saying there always has to be something good. I'm not sitting there saying God comes and causes car accidents. I'm not saying that. But God said, okay, you keep living. And I will utilize your experiences from your choices to humble you. That's why I tell people, you better humble yourself. Do not allow God or the consequence of your sin to humble you. God, man, no, I play. I, I'll take care of the humble process. <laughs> God, how you want me to be humble? How you like it? You like it like what you want? What you want me to do? How you want me to be humble? What is it? I'll sit down and be humble. Let's keep going. The thing we have to understand is, is that we must not or we must never Go by the world's description of this Jesus. He gave us his word to find out exactly who he is. Modern day Christianity seems like they're so fixated with the epistles that they've forgotten the gospels. When a person gets so consumed with parts of the Bible 
and don't ingratiate themselves in the gospel and seeing how this Jesus lived, then you will be a hard-hearted, doctrine-holding Christian. Because when you always go to Paul's epistles, you become a ritualistic, legalistic individual because all you see is rules. In the context, he had to because he was establishing a church. But when a person gets so consumed with these hard sayings, which are beneficial, but you never see the tenderness of Jesus, then you will have an unbalanced way of walking with this in this life. That's why I tell people, when you read Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, and see the fruit of the apostles and Acts, it will show you different dimensions of how we're supposed to walk out this life. The shallow part. The Bible reads, verse uh, 16, and these are the ones sown on rocky ground. The ones who when they hear the word immediately, be very careful with immediately. You ever had people come in and they immediately like you? Watch those folks. <laughs> immediately receive it with joy and they have no root in themselves, but endure for a while. Then when tribulation or persecution arise on account of the word, immediately, another word immediately, they fall away. The shallow heart. The heart that says, man, this gospel is beautiful. I, I want it. <laughs> That's why people go to the altar. <laughs> you don't trust the hand lifted. You trust the life. Let's read it. The shallow heart represents a person who hears and receives the word with joy but has no evidence of change in their heart. And when trouble arises, their so-called faith quickly disappears. You ever had those people? Oh, I've seen many of them come through unplugged. I've seen many come through my church. I've seen They run fast to the altar. Three, four, five, six weeks, eight months later, they fall away. They had no root in them. They received salvation with joy. See, before you receive anything, take time to understand. So our churches have been engineered to pass salvation quick so that we can have the quick response so the church can rally and say, we got 5,000 people saved. And then all of a sudden, if you really audited those 5,000 people, you only really had 50 that were converted. Imagine how God feels when these marketplace churches are portraying a salvation, but not taking the time to audit to see if these people have truly been converted. The sad thing is, a lot of people are looking for the quick, fast, because they say, if I could just get them to the altar fast, baptize them in water, put them in a small group, put them in this group, put them in that, put them in that, put them in that, and then we grow, we grow, we grow. I give it six or seven years, 10 years, 15 years, that thing will come. Because anything that is not ensuring that God's sheep, the Bible says, if one sheep leaves, he leaves the 99 to find the one. But what happens is we preachers are so consumed with traveling. Pastors are so consumed with those, those checks that they don't know what she's coming and going. Right. And they don't got no system in place to say, okay, where where she at? Call her. Can I get someone to call her? Because I see on her Instagram, she's going, I got people I'm connected to. Call them. See where they at. Because how can you sit there and bring them to God and when they drift, God, don't, God has to use hands, flesh and blood. Don't get my sheep. Amen. But if you don't got no proper calculations of who's sheep or who's still goats, you ain't going to be able to bring the one back. Well, they'll eventually come back. And when they get one, they, the, the, the Bible says when the spirit has left this house, if the, when the spirit comes back and sees that the house is still swept, but not full. He goes and gets seven times more demons than him so that that person's faith is worse off. 
That's why this thing is too serious to let people go back out there like the devil ain't going to be like, oh, you ain't going to get it back. Because he knows they received it with joy, but they wasn't converted. And you thought the demons that had him the first time were strong? Mm -hmm. Chances are when they find that young girl and that young man right back out there, they're going to try to make it even more difficult. Then what happens when she comes to her senses and we become like the first son, the son that when the prodigal son comes back, and the father be like, go kill the fattest of past. And the old young boy ain't even coming to the party because of his own self-righteousness. Because God, has, Father, have I not been here the whole time? You ain't cut no fatted calf for me. What about me? Have I not been faithful? That's why the prodigals don't come back because we're too busy talking about why no fatted calf haven't been cut for us. And we're so consumed about us versus them. Amen. We should be rejoicing every single time. With such fervor that we're gonna be like, oh, come to my group. What's your number? How you wanna hang out once or twice a week? Or not once or twice a week? Every night? Because I wanna make sure that you know that y'all like, hold up, Josh. This ain't Father Day. They ain't have all that. But what I'm saying is, when a person gives interest, teach them the truth. Amen. Let them know. Listen, I'm here with you. I wanna make sure you really know God. Because the, people, the thing, the real reason why people leave God at times, because he they, he has been misrepresented. Yes. Amen. And his people have been misinformed about. I talked to someone that I'm life coach now, so I had a coaching session with a young lady. And she was saying about how she used to prepare, let me bring a water up here. Can someone give me a water please? Thank you. There was a um, she was like, I told her, I said, do, do you not know God loves you? Do you know he's a great father? And she was crying the phone because she was like, my father, it's hard for me to perceive God like that because my dad was there, but he wasn't. And I said, I said, you know what? You know what the devil's after the boy? Because how we view men to a degree will determine how we view God. That's why I told him when I said, the, the judgment didn't come when Eve ate the fruit. It came when Adam ate the fruit. Right. Eve wasn't there to receive the assignment. Adam was. It was Adam's responsibility to make sure he guarded the gift that was given to him. But when it came down on the man, imagine. Now, people get mad at me when I say this. I'm not saying this is theology. I'm just saying visualize this. Why would God ask the question, Adam, where are you? Could it be that God was giving Adam a chance to repent? And he said, if you don't repent, it's okay. Because the second Adam is coming. That's why it doesn't matter who fell short in Eden. I'm glad the second Adam stood strong in Gethsemane. Right. Because it was that garden that when he stood tough there, I know for a fact I can stand tough any garden I find myself in. Because I know who my gardener is. That's why you gotta make sure that your heart is not shallow. Because if you always find yourself in and out of the church, in and out of following with God, you happy one season. You ever people, they on fire seasonally. <laughs> Seasonal saints. Come fall, they ready to follow God. Come spring and summer, <laughs> they in South Beach. You know what I'm they live it up. Because they, they're still resting on, well, I went to the altar in 96. Mm -hmm. I went to the altar in 05, so I guess I'm good. This text is trying to tell us, if you have a shallow heart, you received it with joy. But when you begin to face tribulation and persecution on account of the word, mm -hmm. they immediately fall. That, that means he says, you know what? He's trying to tell his boys and the ladies that was with the people that was there. He was saying, look, y'all. Y'all receive me as the Messiah. But y'all's perception of me as the Messiah is wrong. Like I told y'all a couple weeks ago, Peter looked at Jesus as the Messiah as one who was going to come and have a kingdom now. <laughs> like, he thought, oh, you about to dethrone Caesar. I'm with Caesar, the Caesar of all Caesars, right? So their perspective of the Messiah was wrong. Just like many of our perspectives of this Christian walk is wrong. He was saying, listen, on account of me, you're going to face tribulation and persecution. 
And if you are the proof of your salvation is you being willing to stand in persecution like I stand, it's like I stood still on the cross for you. He says, can you take the pain for me like I took the pain for you? If you can't join in this suffering with me, then you're not of me. And he says, you know what? I have to initiate. I have to let life be hard. So that those who really love me, the Bible says those that are saved, uh, only those that endure to the end are saved. That scripture's key. That means I have to endure. I have to weather the storms. I got to follow him to the end. And a lot of people, hearts are so shallow that they received God with joy, but let go just as quick as they received it. The anxious heart. Y'all follow me? The anxious heart represents a person who seems to receive the word, but their heart is full of cares, riches, and pleasures. The things of this world take up their time and lure their attention away from the word, making no time or room for it. Let, let's read. It says, verse 18. And others are the ones sown among thorns. They are those who hear the word, but the cares of the world and the deceitfulness of riches, 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 and the desires for other things enter in and choke the word and proves unfruitful. Anxiousness, anxiety, cares, concern. The deceitfulness of riches. The devil knows the two ways to keep people from God is for them to carry their cares and to pursue riches to take care of their cares. The Bible says it's easier for a man, it's easier for a camel to go through avenue than a rich man to get to heaven. It talks about also that you cannot serve both God and money. God must be the provider if he's the gardener. The beautiful thing about the seed process is that a seed doesn't have to control whether the sun is going to rise or the rains are going to come. His or hers provision, the seeds, provision is supernatural. The seed don't got to wake up and make things happen. The seed just simply sits where it's supposed to sit and let the supernatural elements cause the growth within. But when you have these cares, and these concerns, it chokes. There's so many people who want to follow God, but like the dudes in Luke, hey man, follow me. Well, you know, I, I want to follow you, but I got to go bury my, my, my dad. My dad's about to die, I got to go bury my father. He said, let the dead bury the dead. Hmm. That's hard. What you mean, God? In the Bible days, he was the firstborn. He, was, he wasn't concerned about his father's death. He was concerned about his inheritance. So he said, no, I'll follow you after we bury my pops and I get my inheritance, then I'll follow. God said, I don't care how, you know how when, we, when people ask us questions, pastors, or when God asks you a question, or when friends of accountability ask a question, we, 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 uh, we, 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 we delicately present how we feel. <laughs> oh, well, you know, I, I serve the Lord. You know, we're good. We're just, you know, it's just, you know, we, we don't like to tell the truth. And we come to God like God will read our hearts. <laughs> we be giving God these, these fake answers, these, these well-polished answers, and it sounds so good. You know, you ever give someone advice, and the best way they shut you up is saying, well, I feel like it's what God wants me to do. <laughs> Every time someone tells me, I don't believe you. <laughs> I'm like, you ain't, that's something too, when something like serious about marriage, some serious like relationships, some serious about moving. I don't think you saw God long enough to know the answer. <laughs> People be talking about what God told me yesterday we supposed to get married. What? <laughs> Y'all ain't had no counsel? You ain't talk to nobody about this? No, but we're in love. No, God, 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 we don't got no job, but we're gonna do it anyway. What? <laughs> you ain't gonna bring no baby home? You ain't gonna bring no bread? People, I, if you hear the stuff that I hear all the time, they make you feel like you ain't, they make you feel like your relationship with God is so low. I'm like, God must speak a lot in your life. <laughs> Why do you speak like that? 
I want to hear God like you hear God. Teach me. <laughs> teach, teach me. And I'm like, man, I know my word. God used to be discouraged. I'm like, how the, how the babies hear you, Father? And I've been following you for years. You don't speak like this. And God be like, man, I ain't speaking to them. But the fruit proves if they truly saw him. Oh, yes. Oh, I have people, they tell me, I feel that's what God tells me to do. You can see in their eyes, they just want you to stop asking them. Because they want to do what they want to do. And they know if I put God's name on it, you will stop asking. And I look them in the eye and I'd be like, well, you'll be back in about a few months. <laughs> and you'll be right back. Because God ain't telling you nothing crazy like that. Everybody think their relational marriage story is some story engrafted in the text of the Bible. <laughs> they swear that, that they that they gonna find their husband and their wife in such a special, unique way, and God wants you to get married with no money, no roof to put. Everybody think everybody think you're gonna get married like Joseph and Mary did. Like Mary didn't go through hell herself. And Joseph almost divorced them because he didn't believe. He was impregnated by no Holy Ghost. Who's here to Who's here to Joel? Ain't no Holy Ghost. Where's Henry? Because I'm about to. No, no, even Joseph, he's respectable. Joseph's like, I'm going to divorce her quietly. Eve had to go through so much that even uh, that most people probably didn't even believe her because they probably didn't see the resurrection. They wasn't there for the cross. So imagine God, uh, the Holy Spirit impregnated me. Girl, who you speaking with? <laughs> Ain't nobody. God knows good and well not too many people can handle those kind of stories. If that's your story, great. We'll be watching. But my thing is, <laughs> you got to, that's why I tell people, when God tells you something, don't tell no one else. Yeah. God will confirm what he told you privately, Absolutely. publicly. Let him, that's why all that stuff that I don't tell people, because if you tell people, everybody feel like they can be hands on in what you're going through. Well, it ain't happening yet. That's why the Bible says be very careful on talking about stuff you plan on doing. Because people always ask, is it built yet? When you gonna start your ministry? <laughs> yeah. Oh, okay. You want you a preacher while you ain't keep your mouth shut and let God reveal you your pub your private life publicly. The good heart, the ready and receptive heart. Oh, I got, I got eight more minutes, okay. Um, and I was guilty of that. I used to tell everybody about dreams. We're gonna do this by about two weeks. <laughs> and and that's that's just that's just young, zeal, and no maturity. Sometimes you say, God, because sometimes God will tell you stuff ten years before it's time. Yes. God is the worst at that, man. God, God showed me. You know why God does that? He shows you, and I can tell you about my life. When I was 19, and I was in my dorm room, he showed me like a vision, stadiums full of people. He showed me revival in the streets. He showed people, he showed me, I mean, the, eye, the far as the eye can see in America. He showed me planes, and I was getting off planes in other countries. He saw me, he showed me hospitals. I'm telling you, God is true. He showed me hospitals and people come out. He showed me. I thought we're gonna get started tomorrow. Monday morning, God, I saw that for that. <laughs> God, I'll be there wherever we stay. I'm looking up online, looking up state, and we could do this in St. Louis. I was in Tulsa. I was like, we could go to Dallas. I was friends with some of these big pastors and sons and daughters. I was like, yo, Benny Hand, yo, Benny Hand's daughter, like, what can we do? I was talking to David Lynn. I was like, what can we do? And God was like, I told you this thing 10 years soon because I showed you something big. And then when you try to face your own strength, you're going to come running back to me, begging for me to be implemented back in the story. Right. God always shows you in glimpses, but never shows you the journey. Because if he showed you the journey, you can follow him to it. The good soil. Verse 20, but those that were sown on the good soil are the ones who hear the word, accept it, and bear fruit. Let's read. Real quick. It says the good heart represents the one who hears, understands, and receives the word, and then allows the word to accomplish its results in his or her life. A good heart is birthed out of an individual who allows the sower slash gardener to toil their heart. A good person's heart says, my heart's now ready. Now don't get me wrong. 
People will pose the question, is every believer's heart really that ready? Listen, there's some fruit that the heart, like pineapple, is going to grow in the same soil as orange tree. Just because another person's heart is different, doesn't, because who defines a good heart? A good heart is a heart that's receptive and that will yield some 30, 60, 100. Instead of people allowing God to toil their hearts, many will rather allow the world to continue to spoil their hearts. Without God's toiling the heart, without God toiling the heart, the heart will naturally turn or remain callous or hardened, unable to be committed to God, shallow and full of cares. The supply, real quick. You can measure the state of your heart by its return, fruitful or unfruitful. My last point, an untoward heart leads to missed opportunities. For the next few weeks, we're going to be talking about the different hearts in depth. We're going to talk about the first question we talked about today. Is there any evidence of you being saved? The second question is how to maintain this good heart and how to avoid it being hard in some areas, shallow in some areas, anxious in some areas. Because not only the enemy, if you're saved, you don't care about your salvation. He cares about the impact of that salvation. We should endeavor to ask God, God, I want that 30, that 60, or that 100 return on my life because of the seed you sown in it. A lot of people get so consumed with the fast pace of life, the country club vibe of Christianity, that they don't take the time to even see if they're really a part of his family. Everyone loved Jesus when he turned the water into wine. But turned away when he says, in order to follow me, you have to eat my flesh and drink of my blood. At that point, everyone from one wine to the second wine, people begin to turn away. You don't know if you truly follow him until you're following him is tested. Only then will you know if you've truly been converted. Let's pray. Father, I thank you for this time. I pray this message was a blessing. I pray, Father God, we go into self-examination mode. That we take the time to look in instead of looking out. That we begin to see if we're bearing fruit with keeping a repentant. But Father God, let us also rest for those in this room and those listening. That we have the fruit. Let that fruit, let that evidence of your pursuit in our lives help us stand firm and test it. I pray, Father God, that these great men and women truly have been converted. If not, I thank you, God, that you're on your way to their heart in order to toilet it, to make it a good ground. We thank you. We love you, God. Jesus, we pray. Amen. Amen. For those watching on YouTube, listening online, thank you guys so much for watching. Feel free to engage. Below, there's some, there's some links where you can, you can give, you can get involved. If you're in the Charlotte area, please come check us out. Also, uh, feel free to pass this message along if you're listening on Google Play or Apple Podcasts. Thank you for listening. If you're watching on YouTube and you want you never heard about my podcast, please go Find the website, go here, download, uh, and uh, share, and we love you guys. But for those in the room,